Facts. First and foremost, how long have you been working on the project? Um, shit, I feel like I've been working on this project. I feel like I've been working on this project forever. This is the project that I've always wanted to make. And that's why I called it Daryl, because this is me talking about topics that I probably didn't even know how to touch bases on or articulate at the moment. Um, me talking about trials and tribulations in my life. And me having to grow as a person and a human to actually be able to articulate what I want to say. So, um, yeah, it took my life to, to make this type of music. Otherwise, I was making music and putting it out and people was fucking with it. And I don't know if I, if I could curse. I could, oh, yeah, people was fucking with it. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I just feel like, uh, but I was like, while I was making that music and I was putting out music, I was always like studying and trying to figure out how to better myself and growing as a, a human. And when I took that time off, or when we all took that time off, talking about the pandemic, and then coming out of the pandemic and living a little bit for like an extra two years, um, I was working. You know what I'm saying? I was I was steady working. So, um, yeah, I never stopped working, even if I'm working in the dark when people don't see me working. I'm always just trying to strive to make myself better and, and more fresh because I don't want to put out no regurgitated work. Hmm. I was gonna. I was gonna ask you. How do you feel like this project is different from your previous ones? Um, this project is the first time I I stopped to create. Like stop. Like all my my pre. Like so you got the first project, and that's actually the project Trap Lord that took my life to make that project because you have like from the moment I was born, all of what I soaked up as a human. And, and went to school and life experiences, everything that shaped and molded me into who I am and became, that all went into that first album, Trap Lord. Like, I made that album early 20s. So, like, that was 20-plus years of experience that went into that one project. People just look at it like, oh, yeah, he made that during that time, that year. No, it took years of experiences to create that project. So, boom. that So, you got to say Trap Lord took like 20-something years to make. After that, it was like, oh, you made hits. So, it's like now we keep the hits going and keep making music while I'm in it. And you don't really get a, a chance to really stop and ask yourself why. Like, why am I doing this? Or, you know, what, what do I want to change in the world with what I'm saying? And, you know, how do I want to, like, evoke emotion through people with vibrations and sound and just lyricism this album i stopped to do that like i said we all stopped but it's like i was able to sit down and really like ask myself like what do i want to bring to the table of, of music that's what's up right there uh i want to ask you about some of these songs just uh, say whatever you want about it and just make sure you say the title in there. Yeah. So the first one, I was actually listening to it. It comes out Friday while you was walking in. Yeah. Shit was crazy. Me and that's DJ crazy. Head that's was like, yo, that's wild. <laughs> yeah, they thought I was dead. Yeah, that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, it's because I've been gone so long. And um, I was I actually made that song for like Deion Sanders and uh, Shador and their whole team when they kept losing. And, you know, they had, like, the world against them, it felt like. But, you know, it was, uh, it was like, half and half. Like, some people was, like, well, not half and half. Everybody wanted them, from my, my side, everybody wanted them to win. So I wanted to create a, um a anthem for them to get activated and, and turn up and, and beat the guys. So that's what I made it. I made it for them, but I also made it for myself because I seen a lot of naysayers and things like that and kind of, like, not counting me out, but they kind of like trying to ruffle my feathers. And I, I looked at it as a good ex exercise to go in there and just, you know, create an anthem that just express like everybody's comeback story. It's like, you know, like when you thought like I was knocked down, you know, Rocky Balboa is like I come back like right when you thought I was dead and, you know, I, I prevail again. So that's what this song is about. The next one that's been going crazy, and it's good to see you and Future back on the same track again, that Allure. Yeah, Allure. Yeah, Allure is, Allure is menacing. I mean, that record, when me and Mike Will 
and uh, True, we all when we cut that record, that record was already menacing. Like it was like crazy, and you know I learned this from Michael Jackson. Like well, heard like Teddy Teddy Riley talk about a Michael Jackson story. He said Michael Jackson would create all of his music and be finished with the album, but then he'd be like, "All right, how can we make it better?" And so he'll go and and go back and remix every song to like make it better. So like that's what I did with my album. I just went back and I was just trying to figure out like, all right, we got this and we all feeling it, but like how can we like take it up a notch? And Future was definitely taking it up a notch. So I reached out to Future and he blessed it. And uh, yeah, we had a really good conversation before we went in the studio. I, uh, he recorded that his verse in his house. So I had I had flew to Miami. I had called him on the face. I'm like, where you at? He's like, I'm in Miami. I said, I'm coming tomorrow. So um yeah, I, I had pulled. He calls me like one o'clock in the morning. I'm like getting tired and shit. I'm like, yo, he's not. When, when is he gonna call? Cause I'm trying to. I gotta go to sleep. I'm like, I'm not even in Miami to party. I'm trying to get this verse. So he called me like one one thirty in the morning. I pull up to his crib and um yeah, we had we had chopped it up for a minute. Caught up. And then, like, our conversation, you could just hear pieces of it going to the verse. And um, I just thought that was a, a dope, cool, like, experience just to see, like, how he worked and his process and stuff. Um, we recorded together one time on his tour bus when we was on tour together. But just to see, like, how him and his engineer works, he, like, mumbles stuff until, like, a word comes out. And his engineer just knows what to keep. And then he moves on to the next thing. And he's looking at me after every... Every bar, like, like he just like knowing like them shits is hitting. So, yeah, and I think we got like a really good synergy when it comes down to um making music and building together because we both make cinematic music. Yeah, I mean, yeah. new level still goes up. New ne- new level could be like a intro for Batman or something like. That's what it sounds like to me. It sounds like like y'all need to license that for like the next Batman, like. That's what it sound like. <laughs> a lot <more>. too. <laughs> uh, off white rose. Yeah, off white rose, and that was just a Lucy. That's not even on the album. Off white rose. Shout out to Harlem. Shout out to Ron Browse. Um, shout out to DJ Webstar, the voice of Harlem. All of the Harlem shakers and dancers that popped out. Yeah, off white rose is just a is an energy that's familiar. And the beat just sounds so familiar, but at the same time futuristic. Uh, that's like the traditional Harlem dance record, and I just wanted to bring it back home. And that's that's what this whole thing is about. Like me, uh, I guess, like if you want to call it my comeback, or if you want to just you know call it like, oh yeah, Ferg putting out music again. It's like showing people like I didn't forget where I came from. And hey, you've been killing the features too. That hot one. Oh, yeah, yeah, Hot Ones. Hot Ones go crazy. I was just talking to Denzel this morning. Yeah, shout out to Denzel. That was like another one. We did that a a while ago, actually. So when he dropped it, I was like, oh, we did that like a few months ago. And I kind of forgot about it, but like that's one of my highest streaming records right now, like besides Dreams, Fairy Tales, and Fantasies. Yeah, no, that shit goes up, man. And then I saw you and Trey the Truth got one. Oh, yeah, me and Trey the Truth, yeah. That rock out. Yeah, rock out. Yeah, me and uh, Tr- me and Trey knew each other for years. Like he always like took care of me and the mob. Like when, whenever we came to Texas, he's like part of the Texas family along with Bun B, Killer Calione, and all of the guys. Can't forget Solange. You know she's my Texas family too. Um, yeah, like he always looked after us, and I felt like it was only right. This this um part of my life, I feel like is about working with people that really mean something to me one and two um instrumental in my career even if they play the background um and just like meaningful things like people I could really reach out to if I need something or call if I need something people that have been supportive all my life um yeah just maintain those good relationships like you was exactly. talking about earlier man yep and Future is one of those guys, you know, Trader Truth is one of those guys. Uh, Neek Bucks, you know, we did something together, Loaded Lux. You know, I grew up watching him battle rap, so I had to get something done with him. 
So I was like, you know, even my childhood heroes like Loaded Lux, you know, Jay Mills, Vado, you know, um, me seeing that like Neek Bucks is actually a superstar, you know what I'm saying, in a, in a neighborhood. Just because like somebody don't got like a gazillion followers or whatever the case may be, I don't judge people by that. I judge people by the talent and what they're actually saying, what they're putting in the music, and yeah, exactly. Like that's that's how I go off of it. I don't follow like the algorithm of Instagram. I follow like my own real algorithm in real life. Yeah, shout to Neek, bro. Yeah, yeah, that's a homie right there, man. What's one song off the project that you're like really excited about? One song off the project that I'm really excited about, uh, it's a song called Pool. That's a really, like, uh, in-depth, deep dive into, like, the trials and tribulations of my life. Um, I think it's, like, probably one of the most honest songs I ever wrote. I've never even heard anybody be this honest and direct on a song. Uh, I would say um, Chosen because I got Mary J. Blige on it. Um, Talk about that yeah, one Chosen is Chosen is actually Was supposed to be the intro But I kept making like Really good songs And I'm like man This is probably gonna have to be The outro But then like you know, I got a self Self-titled um, Song called Daryl um, As a, the outro But Chosen is right before that So Chosen I got Mary J. Blige on it And my mom So shout out to Mary J. Blige And my mom Uh Mario Wanas did the beat. He did the piano. We was listening to a lot of Clark Sisters and things like that, praying before our sessions, going in there and just, you know. He started, uh, we was listening to, uh, I forget which, which Clark Sisters song we was listening to, but we got inspired and he started like playing with the piano and did like this melody. As soon as he started that, I told him, yo, loop that, put that inside the session. I went into the booth and I just, it just started coming out of me. Um, and then I took like the songs that I had that I, that I was calling my album at the time. I don't know if it was like all of my album yet, but like Mary was like loving everything. And she's like, I want to do all 40s. <laughs> and she wound up doing two. So she did Chosen and um, she did a song called Casting Spells. Shout out to El Mean too. El Mean is a, a dope artist, a soulful singer from out of London that's really killing it. He kind of got like that D'Angelo kind of like Maxwell, like anything great. I hate comparing people, but like it's very soulful and very like he's a vibe. So yeah, Mary, my mom, El Mean on Chosen. Me and Mary on casting spells. That's dope. Yeah, El Mean is dope too, bro. Oh, you know about El Mean? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. You know how I found out about El Mean? Uh, Virgil's last Louis Vuitton show in Miami. This is when he passed away, and they did a a show, and they like had a, a air balloon with the big LV on it, and they built this big statue of Virgil, like colorful statue. They played this song called Golden that had everybody crying. And then when I researched the song, it was El Mean. Mm. And they said that Virgil put a playlist together that that was one of the songs on the playlist before he passed away. So I guess they was playing songs from his playlist. And that one just had everybody bawling. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I was like, I want to evoke that type of emotion. So I went looking for the dude. I went to London. I worked out of this uh, place called The Church. It's actually a church studio. Um, Adele works there and a bunch of other great artists. And, um, yeah, me and El Mean, we locked in for like two weeks in London. That's dope, bro. Last two questions, man. What does hip-hop mean to you? Hip-hop is a culture. Hip-hop is family. Hip-hop is a brotherhood, a sisterhood. Hip-hop is life. Hip hop is everything. Hip hop is breathing. You know what I'm saying? Like I could not even like breathe. Like I couldn't like if 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 I couldn't like express myself the way I'm expressing myself now and like take hip hop out of that, I would totally like be missing a step. Like if you took hip hop out of my expression, I I could not live. 
that's what hip hop is. It's like breathing. Yeah. Last one. What's your most memorable moment in hip hop? And it could be anything. First time you heard saw something, saw something. First time you performed somewhere. Just that memory that sticks out to you. The one that just popped up in my mind is me dropping my first album and having uh, my Bape collab t-shirt um, from the Bape store. And then um, we did an after party because I did my listening party at the Bape store. And then we had an after party in Brooklyn. It was like everybody on stage. We all had Bape hoodies and the Bape Ferg T on. It said Trap Lord on it. And like, it was a moment where I'm looking at the crowd and I'm looking at everybody chanting my songs and I just imploded with emotion and started crying because I thought about my father. And I would have loved if my father could uh, witness that moment with me. I know he is in, a, in another dimension, some type of way, but in his physical, I wish he was like there. And um, yeah, I'm not even like that type of person. Like I, you know, I, I got a lot of losses you know, I'm I'm really I'm solid when it comes to stuff like that, but that, that particular moment really touched me and I just imploded with emotion and I like I fell back and like all my friends and they felt it with me. Like they didn't even ask what was wrong. They just like was like, You got it, you got it, you got it and then I just finished performing work and that was like one of the most monumental moments that I remember. Man, that's what's up, man. I get where you come from because I lost my pops earlier this year. So they oh, just be man. yeah, they just Sorry be moments where it's like you Sorry cool, and then something happens. You see yeah. something, you think about something like, damn, if he was here, man, yeah. he'd be like smiling. So I get yeah. it. Yeah, it's so wild because I look just like my dad. Like I'm talking about like a splitting image. I be posting pictures of us sometimes, and he looks, we look like twins. So when I look in the mirror, I still feel like he's here in a lot of ways. So, you know, even when he passed, I might have cried like once and like try to get it out of me. Um, but I, I really was being strong for my family and stuff. But that, that moment right there took me out. Yeah, I get it. I get it, bro. Uh, 